12. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Welcome everybody to episode number four. And in this episode, we are with Ms. Rhonda Harper. Um, and she is the founder of Black Girls Surf, correct? Correct. All right. <laughs> and she's actually coming live to us from all the way in Senegal. So I'm, you know, ecstatic to have her here. Uh, I'll say this, and then we're just going to kind of jump into it. This is going to be real conversational style. Um, so not, you know, where were you, blah, 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 blah. You, we're just going to have a chat. Um, but I'll, I'll say this. I've been surfing once. I took surfing lessons uh, for my birthday um, two years ago. And when I say I fell in love with it, I fell in love with it. I will say I did not know it was going to be so hard. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Like when I got <laughs> done with my lesson, I went home and I slept. Like I slept. I was like, man, this was yeah. this was a crucial workout. So yeah, man, I'm I'm in love with surfing. I was living in San Diego at the time. And I there's I'm in Dallas, Texas, so there's no um there's no beaches anywhere close, but uh hopefully I can get back out to the West Coast to uh get back into surfing uh sooner or later. But um you know, with that being said, I just want you to, if you could introduce yourself, you know, where you're from, you know, how you grew up and all that good jazz. So I'm Rhonda Harper. I am the founder of Black Girl Surf. I'm from San Jose, California, actually, and originally from Kansas City, Kansas, which is why this is all amazing, because what little girl, you know, in the Midwest, and I, this is why I do what I do. What There's a little girl that is in the Midwest in 1970s, so I can be on television and Stevie Wonder was on Muscle Beach Party and then connected that, that scene with her life and then became exactly what she saw on the screen. So I've been surfing since I was 10 years old. I started surfing in Hawaii, but I moved to California when I was 10 years old and I was already in love with the ocean even before. Um, I'm gonna date myself who, like I said, I'm from the, the, the 70s, so there was Wild World of Sports, long time ago, and they used to have surfing on, actually on television for just a brief moment. It didn't catch on, right, diversity. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it was short-lived, but it was on there. So I got to see it in real life. And then I was a skateboarder from the time I was seven years old. Um, I'm, I'm what we call, I'm from a huge family. So we're like the Black Brady Bunch. There's three girls and three boys, and I, I would be Cindy. Um, and so all of us, when one gets a skateboard, you know, your parents, they're going to get all six of you skateboard. So we started skateboarding. Tony Alva and those guys from Dogtown were all, they were all in our magazines when we were growing up as kids. So those were, that was the California influence. When you're in Kansas City, like you want a California dream and you know, all of that stuff, yeah. you know? And so as I got older, I was like, mom, it, when we moved to California, my dad is retired Air Force. So mm -hmm. we would go to Hawaii on a regular basis. I mean, you could go, I know that sounds like weird, but when you're a retired military vet, you can go to an Air Force base or one of the bases and catch a hop for like $5. So like for $5 for each kid, that's like what, you know, $30 and they take your whole family over to Hawaii. So we kept going to Hawaii. Like it was Reno, Nevada. Like it was like right next door. <laughs> I mean, it was at one point me and my brother were like, cause we were, we were super young. We we're just like, and we had to stay in the hotel. We we're just like, why are we here? You know what I mean? Like we seen this already, we were bored, but I was always enchanted by, you know, just by the ocean. And I remember sneaking out of the hotel cause we we're bored. Like we were bored, bored. We'd sneak out of the hotel and there was like this, you know, a, a ramp where you could like, there's a little platform you could swim out to. It was far. It was like a quarter of a mile from the, the actual shore. And you swim out there and you dive off the side of it. And I, me and my brother, we used to take races and, and we just, you know, that's what we did the whole time we were in Hawaii. And then I came back home in, uh, I started getting in trouble. I was already getting in trouble when I was in Kansas City because I grew up in an all white neighborhood. We moved from like the black community into the white community. And it was so hard for us to adjust because we're used to having people around us that look like us. Now we're in this foreign land, like literally across the track so we could like look and see where we used to live. And so we were being called the N-word on a regular basis. I mean, going to school, at school, the teachers, I mean, everybody. And I was going to Catholic school at the time too. And I was just fighting all the time. And so in, you know, 1976, the movie Rocky came out. And my father nicknamed me Rocky. So he knew that I was always going to be fighting 
Mm -hmm. for other people I was going to be fighting for injustice they knew at a young age that my dad was like she don't care she's going to fight for anybody she didn't care if they're big small whatever she's going to take up for everybody and that's kind of how I lived my life I've kind of always um there was bullies at our school and I would always take up for the, the underdog right I would always be the one that beat up the bully bully I was the bully you know what I mean so I it, that <laughs> transfers over into it, it transfers over into civil rights because we grew up, like I said, we moved from one neighborhood to another neighborhood. And my parents were very active in the civil rights community. My mom and dad, both vice president, president of the NAACP, they were involved with the bus, the busing, the um, Kansas City, the Brown versus Board of Education. We're from that state. So yeah. that was a part of our legacy. That's a part of our life. And like I was a car carrying member of the NAACP at the age of five. It used to be called the junior NAACP. It's called something different now. But we, we thought we were just so cool, you know, and then mm -hmm. we we're realizing as we get older who we actually really are. Roots came out in the 70s and then we really understood. Right. That was my first connection to Africa and who are these people and why are we here and why are, are they there? So I was always intrigued about um coming back to Africa and, and doing things. And my dad, like I said, he was a retired Air Force. So he worked at the um, unemployment office. And what he was doing was he was transitioning um, black veterans from the military during the war, after the war into you know civil service and into real life, whether they were going off to rehab centers or whatever. That was what my mom and dad were like passionate about. My mom on the other hand, worked for um, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and so that's how we got to Kansas. That's how we went from Kansas to California. Yeah. She got a government transfer. And you know, little kids, we were like, there was only two shows we really watched when we were kids. One was Soul Train and the other one was Beverly Hillbillies, right? So we had two choices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We had two choices on where we wanted to go. And you know, of course we couldn't move to Beverly Hills. So they decided on the other one. So we took right. Soul Train and a swimming pool in San Jose, California. So our civil rights, our civil rights in, in our family, it just kept going. And we were all activists, like all of us, literally. I remember passing out flyers when I was five. I remember doing the Martin Luther King speech. Now I'm seven, right? I was born in 68, the same year Martin Luther King died. And at the age of seven, I'm already doing the I, I had a dream speech in front of the entire NAACP. So I knew my parents were going to be huge influences on my life. And I kind of like held on to my mom's you know coattail all the time anywhere she go and I'd even go down to her office and just like mom you know why is this lady crying about this and that and she said you know they're black and you know they work at the post office this kind of thing and so she was fighting against government the government fighting for the government against the government for a long, long time so I already knew about the trap right and not only on top of that were they doing a civil rights movement but they were also doing prison reform Mm -hmm. So in the prison reform aspect of my life, my parents used to take us over to the juvenile center even before we even moved to California. And would they would talk to you know the juveniles that were incarcerated at that time. You know, they wanted us to see what it was like on the inside of a, what prison life was like. So we wouldn't turn out like that. And so when I was 15, I was already getting in fights for this reason of going to an all-white school. My parents were like, okay, this girl is either going to end up in the juvenile system or she's going to end up dead. There's going to be some, something's going to happen. By the time I was like, I think 14 had already been maced by the police. So mm. um, off they go. You're going to go live with your sister. You know, you know, black man. You're going to go live with your cousin. You know, you go, like, they're <laughs> going to send you away from the problem. And, and so my sister just happened to be going to school at Chaminade University in, in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And she was 19. I'm 15. I'm going to turn 16 when I get out of school. Right. So I, I had two sisters that, you know, that were older at the time. And I said, well, which sister am I going to? She, she said, well, you're going to go with the one in, in, in Hawaii because that's the furthest. Right. So, you know, I tried to look sad about it and I went <laughs> off to, go. <laughs> you know, you know, I'm on punishment. Right. I'm going to go take this. So we moved to the North. So I moved to the North shore of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Right. So now I'm a, I'm a 15, almost 16 year old kid living with my 19 year old sister in Hawaii on the North Shore with no parents. And it's paradise. Right. And I don't know what kind of punishment they thought it was, but I was. <laughs> but I learned a valuable lesson in that. 
-hmm. It doesn't matter where your parents send you off to, you're away from your family unit. So it becomes, you, you feel it in your heart. Like, what can you do to get back to your family unit, even though you're in this paradise and the beach is literally like 30 seconds from your house, right? Yeah. So I would go, I was sort of sad and kind of miss at home a little bit. I would go every day, I would go up to the Turtle Bay Hilton because I lived inside a resort, right? This is real serious punishment right here. Right. So I lived in, <laughs> <laughs> serious. So I lived inside of this, this resort called Turtle Bay. It was the Turtle Bay Hilton, but it was the Queen Lima Estates. And we had a townhouse there, right? And so it was like 30 seconds from the ocean. And I would go to the hotel every single day from the time it, the sun come up to the time the sun went down. And I would sit on this bench and just, it was like watching a, a surf contest every single day. When I moved to Hawaii. I'm, I'm, you tell, your, your punishment just keeps getting worse and worse, you know? It's, har it's just horrible. Heartbreaking. Right? It's, it's just, it was horrible. So they sent me with a hope chest, right? Because all black families back in the day, they wanted their kids to do all this stuff. So they put your sheets and paper cups and all that stuff. And they send you on your way to go get married or whatever. You go to college and you have this hope chest. So when I, I left the house, I took all that stuff out and all I put in there was surf magazines. And I was a graffiti artist at the time. And so I put the, the journals and some, some, some magic markers in the, in the hope chest. And I sent that off to Hawaii. I said, I get, I'll get clothes when I get there. So off I go and I'm spending every day at this beach. And finally, so in the eighties, Magnum PI mm -hmm. was filming at, in the North shore and specifically at that hotel. And so I would run up there every day. You know, I wasn't really into like the Hollywood vibe because we grew up because my parents were in NAACP. We grew up around celeb celebrities. So we weren't really like, but I was just sitting there and one day just like daydreaming or whatever. And this guy from the crew came up and asked me if I wanted to go surf. And I said, yes. And uh, he explained, you know, the whole, how it's going to happen, what I'm going to do. They're going to go tandem. Tandem means one's here, one's here, and then we paddle together. And then we stand up at the same time, ride to shore. Very simple directions. Anybody could get that, right? But I'm a 15-year-old kid. All I'm wearing to the beach is bikini. And sometimes it don't work out that way. Because <laughs> he said, we're going to go and I'm going to pull you like this. I'm going to pull you up. You're going to stand up. And then we're going to ride to shore. Easy enough. So we get up. He grabs me by my bikini, pulls it up. I go one way. He goes another way. Right. Now, you remember, he has my bikini. So oh, I no. come up without my top and he comes up embarrassed like, oh, and now you got a 15 year old kid who was super cocky when when she arrived on that island. Right. And you got like a plethora of men that are crew members standing there watching. Now you're sitting here vulnerable. So that was my first lesson in humility. Mm -hmm. And I went home and I said, listen, I'm never going to surf again, ever. Y'all can count me out. I'm never going again. I don't care what you say. I'll just keep reading the magazine. That's all good. Went to school days later, a couple days later. And uh, this guy was selling a surfboard and uh, it was like 50 bucks. So, you know, when you're from California, especially in, in my neighborhood, we all had jobs when, since we were seven. Um, and uh, my mom would say, you're going to get a job. You want those shoes? You're going to get a job. Um, so we did. We got jobs. And I had cash in my account when I went to Hawaii and uh, the guy was going to sell it for $50. I was like, no problem. Like, I'll get that for you. No, no, I'm not going to worry about it. And so there was a kid on the bus on the way home and he just was, he looked broken, right? Because he this, this chick was able to come and just buy the board and he really, really wanted the board. And I was, and I was just starting out. So even if I had the board, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have known how to write it. Yeah. So what I did was I let that kid take that board. That guy's parents called me that night or his dad called me that night. And he was like, listen, I got this other board. It's not as good as the one that I was going to sell, that my son was going to sell you, but I have this one for $25 if you want it. And I was like, 25, that's a deal, right? I got an extra yeah. 25, cool. So, <laughs> so he brings a board and the board, I mean, looking at it now it's hilarious because it like the fin was busting off of it the nose was busting off of it if you know surfboards you know everybody wants their board to be pristine and I used to go to like the surf shop and just stare at boards because that's my first love is the surfboard itself yeah. and I that was that was my baby that was black beauty I wanted to like put that that one velvet with the velvet picture with the girl with the big afro I wanted to draw that <laughs> on the board I love that board it was busted and I didn't care and I taught myself how to surf at, in five days right because I was a skateboarder it was an easy transference yeah. so that's how I got started um surfing that's that's the beginning so it was it was a long hike like I said 
Stevie Wonder was the influence because that was, you, you know, when you see Stevie Wonder at 15 in one of those beach blanket bingo movies, that just mm -hmm. makes you happy. Even as an adult, and I look at it now, yeah. and Stevie was so big in the 70s, right, that you could relate to it. Oh, well, okay, it is super white, and we are, like, fighting against white people right now, but Stevie's there, so this got to be, it's got to be okay, Something. right? Yeah. Not so much, but still. I, I joined, <laughs> I went ahead and joined on in there with them. And it wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't until later on, um, I became a, you know, after my little stint in Hawaii, I became a celebrity designer for years. Yeah. And so I would, would design clothes under the N, 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 MCA label. So yes. like new edition, Bobby Brown, all those guys, we were all, we all had hands. Me and my brother had hands and everybody. Heavy D was, uh, one of my favorite clients and Eddie Murphy was my last one and I was done. So when you get that A list, I don't care what person you are, but whatever career you're in, when you're a doctor, now you become chief of staff or you the chief of the hospital. After that, what do you do, right? Yeah. Eddie Murphy is as big as you're going to get. So I was like, I'm done now. What can I do, right? Because now I'm in my thirties, I'm in my late thirties. What am I going to do? So I said, let me start a clothing line for black people surf influence with that like 70s funky vibe that we had the big colors and all that and I, and I had the design aesthetic all in my all in my head and so yeah. I went to go you know do the research on it and there's no black surfers right I'm the only black surfer I know <laughs> and even my class ring had a surfer on it like it had a female surfer on the side of the ring that I, I was the only one I knew so I was trying to find one and uh, I found a beach in Santa Monica um, where the first African-American, at the time, that's all we knew, he was African-American. After I did the research, I found out that he was Latino um, as well. So he was the very first documented um, African-American surfer. Now yeah. that since we found out that there's, there was a, a woman in Hawaii at the same time of Duke Pond and Moko, which would predate Nick Gobbledon, right? So doing that research and I'm just like, oh, nobody, nobody gonna do anything about it? like there's a whole segregated beach nobody even knows about like nobody's telling the history on it nothing i knew about the other inkwell in in martha's vineyard everybody yeah. knew that because the movie right yeah. and nobody knew there was an inkwell beach in santa monica california right down there on bay street in pico right in the middle of the dogtown air right down where the where the heart of <laughs> white california beaches there's a beach that was a segregated 200 square foot area of land that they designated is as inkwell beach and i remember doing research on it and people were calling it spooks beach and all kind of stuff but it was only 200 square so i imagine that you yes. only have 200 square foot of land and everybody congregates from los angeles in this one spot yeah that's black so it was amazing i couldn't let that go so <laughs> so i uh, went to santa monica the city hall and i said listen what 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 can we do like we can't just leave this like this. Um, and then it was funny because when I went to ask that question, how do you get a plaque at this particular location? There was two African-American ladies behind the counter. And what, they said, well, you got to fill out this form, you know, and if you want to speak on it, tonight is the budget meeting. It was, it was Valentine's Day, 2006. We got to do it tonight. Like, that's the only time. I mean, otherwise, you're going to have to wait five years from now because they do the five-year budget. Right? Oh, wow. and I'm like, oh, my God. So I wrote down. I'm going to do, I want a plaque and I hand it to the African-American ladies, right? And they look at the paper and they look at me and I look back at the paper and they go, good luck. And just had the biggest smile. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, we don't know what's getting ready to happen, but we know it's good, right? So I show up, right? My date is there too. I'm, I'm sorry, but lobster and, and steak ain't tonight. <laughs> right. We got, a, we got a different type of Valentine's Day project. That's right. This is this is the new this is the new type. This is the the stand and deliver type. So I went down there. I waited until like almost twelve midnight. So it still was on Valentine's Day. It was like almost twelve midnight, and they called the community comments. And I went up there and I said, "Listen, you know, do it for the kids because Coretta Scott King had just died. Rosa Parks had just passed away. It was like we were losing." you know, heroes. And here we are with this African-American male that we don't even know the history on. All we have is just a little bit of what somebody else wrote about his history. We're not even really looking at it. And it was so quick that I had to do it. 
but I did it for one reason. Yeah. Not just because it needed to be done. I did it because Santa Monica High was having race riots between oh. Blacks and Mexicans. And I said, Nick Gobbledon is Black and Mexican. Give them a hero, commonality, so that they understand what this legacy is about. This is about them. It's not about the people who took over the land. It's not about the people who burned down. It's not about the KKK who burnt down all these houses to make a freeway in Black neighborhoods and Mexican neighborhoods. It wasn't about that. It was about trying to find that one common ground for both of them to stop fighting. Because I, I, when I saw the helicopters, it was the same night I did the speech. When I saw the helicopters over the school and I'm thinking black and brown kids are about to be killed for yeah. no reason, right? So did a speech, I'm, I'm, they ding the bell, you know, I'm saying my little speech, and ding the bell and, it's, I'm, and I'm walking away and they're like, Miss Harper? And I was like, yes. They're like, can you tell me where Inkwell is? And I was shocked because I'm like, this is the city council. Y'all don't even know. Right. <laughs> so I said, it's right. I mean, literally it was like, I said, it's like at the end of this street, really. And then they were like, really? I said, yeah, they turned it into a, uh, they turned it into a, the sewer drainage for Los Angeles for that, that area. And I said, it's a sewer drainage now. But I mean, if you put like a plaque or a statue or there or something, just so that these kids have something that they can go and visit and look at and say, hey, we're part of this. We're especially yeah. the surf culture, right? So that's the beginning. And then you catapult. Now, I didn't forgot about the, the, the clothing line because now I'm, I'm segueing into social justice. And I didn't really understand that until the actual plaque was dedicated. And somebody from City Hall said, well, how do you feel being a civil rights act activist? And I'm thinking like, I'm not my parents. You know what I mean? Like, that's not me. That's not, I mean, that how do you say that? And they go, no. That wasn't the game plan. And she said, yeah, this is, this is what they do. This is, this is what you're supposed to do. I guess this is where you're going to head. And so it's funny because <laughs> to this day, well, now we have, we, we have a, a collaboration with Hurley, which I'll get to, but I had to create an entire genre just to sell a t-shirt. So there was nothing there for us, yeah. right? How do you find all of these people that you need to sell these clothes to? Not only that, but the, if there's one, there has to be more out there somewhere. If I'm doing it, there has to be somebody else out there. Yeah. So I started looking around and I saw, you know, the Black Surfing Association was there and there were a small group of men who, you know, the, all they wanted to do was, then they said it. They was like, we're, we're not into that, Rhonda. All we want to do is surf. Yeah. I said, well, that's cool, but what about the future, right? So I was always seven years, I keep telling people, I'm always seven years ahead of whatever the trend is going to be, right? Mm -hmm. So we came in style for like seven years or seven years after I said the original comment, seven years after that, well, then we went out and then the trend was gone. And then, then we went out and then I came back again. And every time I do something, I like look out and go, okay, is anybody going to help? Like, are we all going to, as a community, are we all going to like lift each other up and like really build on this community? So it wasn't until 2014, I had become at that time, a journalist after the plaque because Black Athlete Sport Network was like, I never heard of black surfers. Yeah. What do y'all do? I mean, do y'all show up? I said, no, there's like a real surf league, like the NFL, there's a WSL. I said, there's just no blacks in it. And I said, well, the, my goal would be to get blacks into that circuit so we can be seen and and get that sponsorship and and shine like everybody else why are we the missing pig i mean even we even had tiger woods by that time serena and, and venus were there at that time and there was still no black pathway so i became a journalist and they would send me out on these and i mean i got to travel so that was cute mm -hmm. i went to hawaii did the triple crown of course i don't have a problem going back home you know so i, was gonna so say, I went back i had, had no yeah. problem not stayed at the same spot, didn't trip. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, and I, I got to visit all these good places and go to all of these great events, but we weren't represented. Mm -hmm. And then I said, then the spirit of my parents came through and they said, Rhonda, you got to do something. And one day I was just going off about something in my, <laughs> and my mom just turned around and she goes, well, you're an activist. So act like, just like <laughs> that. And it was that simple. And I just, as simple as yeah. <laughs> So I put down the laptop and I stopped going to the contest. And I was like literally boycotting the water in my mm -hmm. own mind. 
until I figured out what I could do to change this. So what I did was, even as a journalist, you you want to know what you're writing, right? So mm -hmm. I would go out there. Of course, I'm a surfer. So I'm like, yeah, he was doing this and it was great and it was so funny. But I noticed that the people of color were getting lower point scores. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily black surfers, but the, you know, the we weren't calling black surfers that were Afro-Latina back then. We weren't we weren't using that verbiage. Now we use it. That's those are the labels. Everybody wants to be Afro-Latino or Afro-Asian or whatever they, they are now. But then you were either black or you were just Latin or whatever you were. And so I would go out there and I, you know, I noticed that the people of color were getting lower scores. And I said, let me go and find out why their scores are so low. So I went, educated myself, went down to the International Surfing Association. They were holding a uh, training on judging and officiating which gave you the reason when you see a, a surfer on a wave, it'll tell you exactly what you should be judging on. So then you can sit in the booth and you can add up the points on your yeah. end and figure out why they're being cheated and how they're being cheated and at what point. So education was always key for me. And they, even in, with my parents, they always tell you never stop learning. So I, I immediately said to some friends of mine, one which just happened to be the national surf champion of Jamaica. See, see how this works? Now you're finding people. So yeah. she was like, let's do this. So I said, let's just hold a contest. At the time, Sierra Leone was going through civil war and, and the kids were being, you know, they were amputees. They were, their hands and feet were getting cut off. And originally we just wanted to go and have a day where they could have a day out in the sun. I call them giving back to the community days when I was taking kids to, from the United States to the beach. But when I got, when I'm, when I'm thinking, you know, Africa, I'm thinking it's more than a give back. It's actually getting your hands dirty and get it into the community and find out what, what's the need. So that was the original thought. And then when we were doing the research and I'm, I'm such a history fool, like I popped on this beach that was called Burrow Beach. Mm -hmm. And I was like reading the history on it. And Bob Burrow was the last king to uh, fight off the British, the the colonization, and so and they treated Sierra Leone. This is in Sierra okay. Leone, and so and they and they regarded him still as a king, even though he was captured. They still treated him like he was a king because he fought like he fought, yeah. you know, with pride and dignity and respect, and and he just was taking care of his stuff and. I said, this is a place. This is like the other inkwell. You know what I mean? Like, let's mm -hmm. just connect all these inkwells, right? <laughs> Where all this injustice comes on. So we decided to hold um, the camp at, at Bora and then doing the research on Bora, I saw this video of these like 12 little boys that were surfing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait a minute, what? That's, I knew about South Africa because South Africa's had a surf community for a while, even though black people weren't allowed in the water. But I didn't realize is that West Africa was surfing, right? I knew South Africa was. So that was amazing for me. Then doing further research, I found out that they found surfing in Ghana even before they saw recorded, recorded it in Hawaii. So actually Ghana and, and Peru have records of them surfing. They don't call it surfing. Uh, dating pre-colonization of the Hawaii, right? And so hmm. I'm like, oh, this is just getting better and better. You know, <laughs> like, like we going home, like we did it. So uh, all kinds of reasons I said, you know, and, and, and then giving the history of Sierra Leone and knowing, you know, Amistad and, and this is how we all broke up. And yeah. this is why you don't see us all together surfing, right? And so I said, well, let's have a Pan-Afro contest. When I saw the 12 boys, I was like, let's have a Pan-Afro contest um, so that we can showcase African talent and Pan-Afro talent. Um, and so the sponsors could see them. And then when the sponsors see you and you get sponsored, then of course you go on to the main tour. That was my goal, right? Yeah. So we, we started planning immediately. Everybody was on board. Every country, everywhere was on board. We had all kinds of men, had all kinds of boys filled up what we were missing. Mm. I had one girl. Her name was Kiaditu Kamara. She was 14. She was the only, she was the first and only female surfer in Sierra Leone. And I said, listen, we're going to put her in there with the boys. That's not going to be a fair. 
Right. That's, that's not right. We what we need to do is we need to find girls. So we started looking in the associations um, around the world, and we couldn't find anybody. I mean, the only one that I knew was the girl that was helping me. She was part of the uh, Jamaican Association, but she was the only one that I knew of. And I knew a couple other older black women, but they were, they were like I said, they were yeah. older black women. And so I knew they weren't gonna come to Sierra Leone for anything like that. So I said, okay, well, we, we was exhausted that one. So let's start looking in the general area inside of the, the camps, surf camps, like Glad Day Surf School, whatever. And we found one in, in Senegal. And that's where we found Haji Sam, mm. who is now the face of Black women in surfing. But at that time, we just had two. And mm. I said, listen, if we just have to do an exhibition, that's fine. Like at that point, we were just like, okay, then we'll let the Euro as long as we have two, then we can let Europeans come in and enter the contest. And then that would make up the heat. So at least we had two in a schedule. Yeah. And uh, we in November of that year, we started seeing the the signs or we heard the first case Ebola and uh every day we watched and people started dying left and right and the contest wasn't until September and then I said to to my staff I said listen uh how long are we going to let this go before we cancel this contest because all we're doing is counting dead bodies like we're not moving forward there's no buildings I mean it was the weight of that was this yeah. is my second pandemic <laughs> this yeah. is the second so so we ended up canceling that contest. And then, of course, that was 2016. And then the United States made the huge mistake of um, electing um, an orange idiot. And then the travel bans came in. So mm -hmm. now, not only do we not have ambassadors in the seats that we need, and all of us need visas, we all need security. We're going into, a, a, you know, I always check the social political environment of any country that we go in. And mm -hmm. at that time, they were just coming out of a civil war, but they were going into a presidential, um, another presidential election, and it was getting fierce. So we were like, mm -hmm. how are we going to bring all these kids to this country? So I said, okay, we're going to have to cancel the contest. So we did. And I said, well, what are we going to do about these two girls? I said, well, look, let's bring them to California because first of all, they can train there. We have different, you know, we have so many beaches that there's different breaks. Any, everywhere you go, there's a different wave. I said, so that's great for training. But also, where on God's green earth can you go and take a West African female and put her on the shores and they not get the attention that you're seeking, right? right. So we tried to get KK and Hajisam out of their countries. And because they didn't have an ambassador in Sierra Leone, we were able to get Haju Sam to California. Mm -hmm. And then as it was almost like as she's traveling in the airport, right? We hear that shirts are going to be included into the Olympics. So now she only not tra she's training for our contest, but she's also training for the 2020 Olympics, right? Yeah. So the, when we heard, and then they started doing the trials, uh, we call back to their to the to federation federation is like we don't want, we have all the money for the boys i mean they literally had all the money for the boys and the staff and they weren't going to pay for the girls so what i did was i got on the phone with with a, a friend of mine who just happened to work at abc and yeah. i said listen i have a west african girl who's training here training for the olympics and we need to raise some money i have a go fund me you know he was like where are you i said i'm in santa cruz he said uh give me like 45 minutes and i'll be there she was on the news that night Mm -hmm. And we have not stopped since that date. I mean, literally, it's one thing after another to what you see today. Yeah. We started off with one club. We're well, not even a club. We had, it was already black girls surf, but we only had two people. So it was really like yeah. these two black girls surf. But <laughs> 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 so, so, you know, up goes our IG. The IG had already been up there and I was kind of putting stuff up there left and right. And then we just started adding on to that. And we just started seeing the numbers rise and everybody's like adding and adding and adding. And then we go from like 120. This morning I checked, we had 43,000. Yeah. Right. And this is in a very small period of time. Of we now. went from, yeah, we had, <laughs> we had, we had one club and now we have 12 clubs. Yeah. So this, they, now we know that there was a need for it. And it's not just us. There are so many now different, 
organizations that have sprung up. But this is what I wanted in the beginning, right? This is what the this is when I see a utopia, like I always like I want to see a movie. I want to take the black beach party, you know, the one that I saw when I was a little kid and they was in a pain and that Funicello and all of them was in it. I want to take that same vibe and then bring that to the black community and have those type of beach parties. The closest thing they have, and I wish I was home, is the black girls beach party that's happening in at Chicken Bone Beach in New Jersey this weekend. So I'm I'm like proud when I see this, they were like, Rhonda, can you come? I said, listen, I'm in I'm in Senegal right now. But next year, definitely, I will definitely be there because I will I will support any and all uh positive black beach activity. And I mean that when I say positive, I mean positive. Like you're trying to move this thing forward. Um there you need you're always gonna have people that are just out there doing whatever they do, right? For money or fame or clout or whatever. We really do concentrate and we just recognize by Malala's fund, the Malala fund, um, for our educational program. Because in order to be a part of Black Girl Serve, you have to be in school. Now, in West Africa, girls going to school isn't important. It's not yeah. the, it, you know, like I, the example I give is the average income here for a year is 720 US dollars, right? Mm. It's 120 US dollars to send your kid to school. So if you have a boy and you have a girl and you're in a patriarchal system, which one is going to school? Right. The boy. So we pick up where the parents leave off. Yeah. Your daughter wants to come. Your daughter want, You want your daughter to go to school? Okay, she wants to surf too. She's got to be in school. We're paying for the fees. We're paying for the books. We're paying for the backpacks. We're paying for food, travel, boards, wetsuits, whatever, you name it. We, we're trying to get it done because the thing is, is that if you, if you give knowledge to one little girl, it's amazing what she'll do for the whole yeah. community. Oh and, yeah. And so I just had five little girls sitting on my sitting on my floor because they, you know, they gotta be by Coach World, they gotta be by Coach Haju all the time. Mm -hmm. And so we constantly have little girls at our house. And we and and the other day there was like I hear row, row, and I look down and there's like 10 little tiny ones, like they look like <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we walk through the village and the little girls are just like, black girl serve. And they're really, they just want to be a part of it. So we went from having mm -hmm. just Haju, right? To over 50 girls now yeah. here in one. And, we're, and, we're, and we've been blessed by the mayor of Angor, the village, the, the mayor here, um, who saw that what we did was exceptional, right? Yeah. And we didn't think, well, this is just something I would have done anyway, just because of my parents, right? My dad said, if you have a skill, go back into the community and start building, like start teaching people. Like I'm not here to help, I'm here to teach so that they can have a sustainable future after I leave. Hadju, who came to the United States with no money in her pocket is now co-owner of a surf school here in Senegal, right? And so yeah. now the mayor saw everything that we were trying to do. And especially the things that I was trying to do and what I saw for the future. And they gifted us beach property right, Ooh. for school number two. So that's the reason why I'm here in Senegal right now to open up I, the second location. So yeah, you you literally answered my question. I was like, so what are you what are you doing in Senegal right now? So question, um, yes. you know, with what you're saying, with all the different uh, schools that you have that are, I'm assuming that they're stationed around the world. Mm -hmm. um, do you go to each one, set it up, and then get it going, and then you move on to the next place? How does that work? Yeah, that's exactly how it works, pre-pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. So now I just, okay, so the last school that we opened was the one in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So, and that's happening during, during COVID. So it's a little bit, you know, it, it, we haven't made it to Sierra Leone because Sierra Leone just locked down the whole country. They were, they got over that Ebola thing. They understood the, they understood the <laughs> mission. They're right. like, we're going to lock the whole country down. We don't care. Yeah. We, did, we <laughs> so done did this school, before. Yeah, no. we did this before. No. We ain't doing it again. <laughs> and so there's a partially built academy. We bought land in, in Sierra Leone. So the partial building already set up, ready to go, when we can go back into the community and continue to build. But South Africa is the last was the last port 
Um, and it's exactly what I do. So when I leave here, I go to South Africa and then I'm going to spend another year in South Africa building up and training those girls down there. Like I pay for all the training for all the girls to be certified. Now, what does that mean? You may not be able to go to college, but mm -hmm. if you're in South Africa and you are attached to a surf school, you can make the money to sustain your, you, what, whatever it is, your family or whatever, because there's constant people coming in from all over the world to go surf the waves in South Africa. But a lot of the girls are missing out because, right? Yeah. Who, it was like, who cares about the girls? So what I did was I paid for the certification for all my girls. So even if you're not training, you're not actively training the girls that are linked to Black Girls Surf, you mm -hmm. can go into a surf school and you can make money and, and, and if they say, oh, no, we're only going to pay you $25. And you say, uh-uh, no, no, I I'm certified. The yes, I got my paperwork, you know, and then your money goes up. And I tell these girls, you know, you have to you have to know your worth from here on out. And I try to teach all my girls that know your worth. Don't just give things away. Right now, there's a lot of giving happening to the WSL. A lot of Black people are giving to the WSL, which is the World Surf League, which is our football league, right? So they're giving themselves away and I, I won't do it. Like they tried to get me on film surfing. Why? You, I need my money right. I'm not one of these people who want to be Instagram famous. This is yeah. like, this is my job. This is who I am. So I need to let you know, if you want me to sell your product and you send me one and I tell you I have 40 girls and you send me one and you want me to put that on my Instagram, baby, that's not going to happen. It's yeah. not, you know what I'm saying? I'm looking, we're, we're past that. And I think that a lot of black people need to understand that. Like they're going to pay what they used to do in Africa. This is what they did. Honest, this is how they did it. They would take, they come, they take a bar of wax or whatever their product was and they put it in an African's hand and they take a picture. Then they go put it on their website. Like they really did something for the community and they probably left a box of wax behind, right? Yeah. But you didn't do anything. And that kid is still poor. And that kid still can't go on to be a famous surfer that he wanted to be when he came up and held that bar in the, of wax in the first place. So mm -hmm. this is what I'm trying to train my kids to not do. Don't let somebody steal your image and go off and make money on it. We just found a, a website where this guy was just making serious money off of how do some and he didn't even have the rights to even sell her image. So it was kind of weird. And they've been wow. doing it for decades. And so that was another reason why I stepped in the picture because I know the business end, right? I know the back end of the whole scene. Like the whole scene is about product placement. The whole scene is about fashion or, you know, um, equipment. So just like you would pay a supermodel, right? Yeah. To wear your brand. Like they had to pay Beyonce, right? To, to Ivy Park or Tiffany company that had to pay her why would you pay an african they, they need it more than beyonce does you know what i'm saying right. and so that's that's my that's my right. huge problem with people coming to africa and feeling like i call it stealing souls but you come over here and you take and you don't give back i came i got locked in the country i don't speak the language i don't speak wolof and i don't i don't speak french i speak english and i have not one i have two camps you understand so you can do and you can still be productive in a, in, a, in a community without having to feel like you need to take over, right? I'm a part of the community. Everybody comes here, they're like, Rhonda, why are you? I'm literally in the village. If I opened my window, you would see village. <laughs> like, <laughs> like real village. Like I think there's some lamb outside the back door. They'd be keeping me up all night. And the goats would be walking <laughs> the street and they still got horses and carriages and whatnot. You know, and people right. are like, why are you? And I'm and I said, listen, this isn't a California thing. You know, you when you get on that plane, and I, I tell this to everybody, especially black people, when you get on that plane and you come across that ocean, all that Western ideology that you had, leave that in the oh, airport yeah. because you're gonna come to a different life. We just had a, a um, an American come, African American come from the U.S. and thank God he was a world traveler, so he understood the mission. You know what I mean? He knew it was going to be rough, but he didn't know that I was living in the rough part. They everybody thought I was at the Radisson Blue or something. You know? No, no. Yeah. No. Mm -mm. I'm down here eating Chevy Jam. You know what I mean? Like they come bring me food. <laughs> I <laughs> ate single. I. I Listen, we get fat on Senegalese food because it's so good. That's, yeah. you know, and then that's what I'm doing. 
there's no McDonald's here. Yeah. There's no KFC, you know. So I don't I don't get that kind of stuff. So I'm 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 privileged yeah. to be here. Right? right. I'm privileged to see that my gap came from somewhere, right? Because yeah. I was always getting teased. Like, you got a gap. I was like, I'm not getting rid of it. And the ice cream man was like, you're gonna be rich one of these days. You got a gap. And I was like, what? He was from Africa. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> He's like, yeah, you know, that's a sign of 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 wealth when you get older. And then I looked and I was like, let's see. Samuel Jackson, Whoopi Goldberg, Madonna. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, down the list of gap people. I was like, okay. But then when you come here, right? Haju and I look like salt and pepper shakers. Everybody thinks we're sisters. Yeah. We have the same cheeks, same nose. I say every and the same gap. So everybody, wherever country I'm in, I automatically belong to them. Like I go to Sierra Leone. Oh no, you said no. You know, you you from Sierra Leone. Your people yeah. is from Sierra Leone. Come here, you Senegalese. I went to South Africa. You from here? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I got another question for you. Yes. Um, it is 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 more so turning back into, uh, like what you're doing with with teaching surfing. I'm like, I don't want to put this. What does it, what does it feel like, to to give back in that manner? Like, for a child, for a girl who has never done this, and now she's out there, and you're teaching her how to do this thing that she sometimes I'm assuming some of them never even even imagine doing this thing of surfing, and now it's like this whole new world for them. What is that like? So, um, you can tell by the smile, first of all. Uh-huh. So that that smile that is generated and the smile that you see coming from me is the same smile that I see when that girl catches that wave. When yeah. she when that board connects to the water and that energy. We had a girl two weeks ago, little girl, cute, nine years old. Um, and, and mom is is Senegalese and, and does the Miami and Senegal thing. And and the girl goes to American school. And this little girl got up on the very first boom, instantaneously stood up and surf the rest of the day. And her face was just lit up. And she came running down the beach and we we're like, what, 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 what? And she was like, I just came to say hi. And then she just <laughs> ran back <laughs> in the <laughs> And she surfed, she surfed beautifully the whole day. As a matter of fact, she's coming out, she's coming out tomorrow to, to finish her lessons. And she's gonna probably join Black Girl Surf at, at some point because she's yeah. already a ballerina and all of these things. But that smile, that that connection to the water that connection from board to water is something that you know you've done it once and yeah. you just said it yourself you're going to go back oh man you I was know so hooked so hooked. yes yeah and it see and the smile comes instantaneously you can't help but smile <laughs> yeah it's, well, you talk about it it's just one of those things you know? it's, it's such a it's such a it's such a wild feeling to like because it's it's power that is not your own that you're connecting with Mm -hmm. and is and then it's like but you as you learn i mean i'm not i had one day but as as you as you learn and it's like the little that i could do where you're like oh you turn the board just a little so it's like now i'm we're connecting and i'm able to use your power to do something that i wanted to do which is right yeah it's it's amazing see you see it's amazing like and i want to just tell you you can surf while you're in Texas. As a matter of fact, that's gonna we're going on a tour. We're going on a bus tour around the United States. Yeah, and me. so one of the stops is one of the stops is in Texas because you have an indoor pool there. So you have an indoor wave pool. It's called the BSR Resort, and it's an indoor pool. It's a it's a it's a machine made wave. Mm-hmm. So listen, at, on these days in COVID, and you know, you know what I'm saying? You got to go surf wherever you can. And, and, and Texas was be able to create that environment. Well, we have one in California. Um, everybody hates that one, but the one in Texas I hear is great. And then we're going to go to the indoor one in the America Mall out in New Jersey. So yeah, don't feel like just because you're not next to the ocean that somebody didn't already make a wave because one of the guys that from Kansas City got a hold of me and was like, you could come home now. We have waves. And he had made right. a wave for Kansas City. <laughs> yeah, I'm on it. Uh, I'm on it. Um, yeah, I think, let me see. Okay, so here's here's a question. Um, for someone who For someone who is thinking about getting into surfing as a profession, 
um, either as a um, as like a, a instructor or as a professional, um, what advice would you give them? Keep your expectations low because mm -hmm. it's a learning process. It's a it's a you can be a coach, but you're going to have days where your trainee doesn't want to do what they don't want to perform. They get up they are people, too. They get up in the morning and then if they didn't have a cup of coffee or whatever gets them going, then they're going to have a bad day. You're going to have a bad day. Don't have your expectations so high because then it it shows not only on you, but on their performance as well. If you're coming in as a. Uh, a, a professional surfer yourself don't put too much on your coach too it's a it's a it's a kind of like a balance it's a it's a it's a beautiful tap dance sometimes yeah. and sometimes it's the most horrifying thing ever because you do you have a mash of personality you know what their performance level are you know what they're gifted and sometimes they can't see that or they don't mm -hmm. realize how special they are and then you have to continuously tell them how special they are just so that they can get up, grab that board and get out at five o'clock so they can get those sponsorships so that they can run around the tour. It's like you, you, you're constantly now, if you're behind the scenes, it's an educational thing, always watching videos of, of surfing and start like judging the contest yourself and then compare your, your score to, to what the actual score was from the judges. And then you, you know, you're preparing yourself for the onslaught of attention, but find out where, they're giving the, the classes, the ISA classes, and you can go on to ISA Surfing. Now, ISA Surfing, the International Surfing Association is governed by the IOC, which is the International Olympic Committee. That's how you see surfing go into the Olympics. And that's why we took a step back from the professional venue until they get this stuff together because they're going broke and, and work within the associations who were missing, you know, black participants in the first place yeah. but get a hold of the the association near you and and participate go out volunteer you know you can always volunteer you don't necessarily have to have a paid position a lot of times they just need scorekeepers or somebody to say hey that guy's up on a wave right and you're giving the judge um the heads up that he needs to be and they're called spotters and and you're just telling the judge hey you need to look at this guy so you can score him properly there's so many different positions there's cameraman yeah. You know, take go and so what we're doing is we're trying to put those intern positions within mm -hmm. our with within our our company because we know what the need is. There's a lot of people that just want to be photographers, right? Yeah. So we have for professional photographers. I don't know if you saw our IG, but a professional photographer. How do you had an idea? She wanted to go out. I knew we needed a, to have a photo shoot, so I called the photo photographer and I said, listen. We need to have these girls with professional photos. Hodges was like, well, let's put them in our tapestry because it was just tapestry, right? Yeah. So he's like, let's put them in the tapestry, um, whatever they're wearing for tapestry. Took them out there, put boards in their hand, did a fashion shoot. And now the thing is all over the world. You know, yeah. <laughs> you, and now that photographer is like, Rhonda, if you want, us to, you want me to come and teach these kids, right? How to do photographer, how to be a photographer, a sports photographer, then we can do it. If they want to be a fashion photographer. Because a lot of people, lose their sponsorship over imagery. Yeah. Black skin has a different lens, right? And a different yeah. ISO than white skin. And you need to know that. And, and that is the difference between holding on to your sponsorship and not holding on to your sponsorship because this is about imagery, right? Is what you see. If you see the water spray, right? Mm -hmm. That looks good. But that same model, if you put her in a in a Hurley outfit, you can't use that same camera. And a lot of times people are using the same thing. Then it washes them out. It doesn't yeah. look professional. It looked like they took it with their iPhone, which I'm not putting down iPhone. I'm just saying there's yeah. other photographers that have different cameras that they can work with and different lighting and stuff. All of that comes into play when you're, when you're taking photos of black skin, just like when you're doing motion. Motion is a little bit different. So a uh, sports photographer is different from the fashion photographer, but they need to know black skin and black movement, right? Because yeah. we we funky. Like, yeah. if you see Michael February surf, as opposed to like Kelly Slater surf, they're like totally two different beasts. And if I have to look at one surf, I definitely would, Mike February got sold. I mean, you could play like any old black R&B music in the background and you could just, you know he's feeling the vibe. Whereas you got Kelly and he's just all over the place with rock music. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's a different, it's everything about us is different. And that's yeah. why 
I want to keep our community tight. I want us to understand that we don't have to assimilate and be like them. You know, when you go to the, it was years, I was going to, uh, I was going to contest and I, the, the song Green Light by uh, my man, yeah, John Legend. And I, the first time I heard that was when I was in Hawaii and I was reporting on the Triple Crown. I was like, is, are they playing, is that John Legend on the beach at a white <laughs> contest? Like they playing Snoop Dogg, and, you know what I mean? But we're not there, but they like our culture. You understand? But they just didn't include us. So now I want to include us, but I'm creating our own lane so we don't have to assimilate. We can just build on our own. So that's why I'm here. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, um, I definitely appreciate you sharing all of this. Um, give me one last thought that you got before we wrap up. Well, our community. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'll, well, I was going to say, do you need to mention it? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, the, no, no. For our community, we need to learn that we can do things on our own. We don't have to attach ourselves to something. And if we do it together, right, we have more sense of pride in that because we did it ourselves. Not because somebody gave you this and gave you that and then they come back and miss Millie you, you know, like I did this for you people. No, we can do this ourselves. We don't need that handout. We don't need that. We've, we have professional people. We have sports agencies and all these other things that cater to us and we need to use them. I'm managed by M88, right? That's who I'm managed by. They, they own macro and you know, they're all about people of color and building in the community. So I'm, I'm, I'm in a perfect fit, right? We need to start building our own. We need to take control of our own narratives and stop giving it to somebody else for their bottom line. It needs to be our bottom line and put it back on our kids so that our kids can be proud of our history and not have to worry about looking through a, a, a book and never ever finding us. Now you can go to a history book and you'll see Rhonda Harper. Yeah. Right. So there you are. Beautiful, beautiful. All right. And um, in the description below, you will have Black Girl Surf website. Um, and I will put every other website in there that Rhonda needs me to put in there to make sure that <laughs> Uh, you guys get all the information that is necessary. And like I always say with every episode, uh, the cemetery is filled with a bunch of untapped dreams. Don't let yours be there as well. So live outside the box, lot box, baby. And we are out.